Hi, my name is Mike Guo. Over the next 20 minutes, I hope to just barely scratch the surface of the very broad topic of cross-border threats to open source. There's an interesting confluence of events happening in the world. I'm not just talking about the immediate everyday crises we have now that force us to have an online-only conference. Rather, I want to, want to take us out of the narrow lens of how do we get through the rest of 2020 Instead, think about the global trends that have been taking place over the last few decades that got us to this very moment. Then I want to introduce, or as it may be, reacquaint you with what's been going on in the more narrow world of export controls. Before I get too far, a quick disclaimer. First, even though I am a lawyer, I'm not your lawyer, and this is not legal advice. Please do check with your own competent legal counsel. Second, I'm speaking for myself here, not on behalf of Salesforce where I work. Now, a quick agenda slash too long, didn't read. My overall theme is open source was nurtured. It came of age in an era of globalization and free trade. But over the last few years, we've seen the trend move sharply in the opposite direction. I don't think it's controversial to say that the world is becoming a more fractured and more nationalized place, with countries increasingly drawing lines in the sand. One of the lines being drawn is export controls. There's a recent law you may not be familiar with, the Export Control Reform Act of 2018, or ECRA. The ECRA provides a statutory basis for what the Bureau of Industry and Security, or BIS, has already been doing with regard to rulemaking for so-called emerging and foundational technologies. BIS, which falls under the Department of Commerce, has been busy making new rules and many more are to come. The rules are being applied to rather broad areas like artificial intelligence, machine learning, microprocessors, and data analytics. Now, Although we generally think that source code is protected under the First Amendment as freedom of speech, there are limits to the First Amendment. If you go back and read the legal cases from two decades ago, the ones that actually established that source code is free speech, you'll find that the holdings are much narrower than you may have remembered. Although we enjoy this protection now, I'm not convinced that we're going to have them forever. As a practical matter, I don't think there's an immediate threat, perhaps not even an imminent threat to existing open source projects, but I do find the overall climate and trends concerning because I think they're going to cause countries and companies to be more reluctant or even legally unable to participate in the open source community. Before I dive into the geopolitical landscape, I want to provide some perspective for you. These days, I'm an in-house patent attorney. I oversee not only a patent docket, but also legal issues relating to open source, along with other IP issues. But long ago, I came of age as a web developer, perhaps just barely trailing what I think of as open source's adolescent years. But most importantly, I'm not an expert control attorney. There are people who actually specialize in this stuff. I think about export controls from the perspective of someone who needs to be able to spot an issue, make a quick risk assessment, and decide whether I need to call someone else who actually knows something. I suspect that many of you are in the same boat. You're not an export control attorney, but you do know open source. And that's not necessarily true for a lot of export control attorneys. You're the audience I'm speaking to. So let's think more about those geopolitical trends I keep on referring to. From the 1990s until about four years ago, there was a general trend of increased globalization and openness in the world. To orient ourselves, 1991 marks the end of the Cold War. With that came the opening up of countries and economies. For example, NAFTA was signed in 1994. The Schengen area in Europe was established in 1995. In 2002, the Eurozone moved to a single physical currency. Also during this time, 
China's economy really took off, growing at close to 10% a year. This made it the second largest economy in the world. And of course, this is also the time period when the internet and World Wide Web saw rapid growth and adoption worldwide. Then there's the last few years. During this time, we've seen the pendulum swing back sharply in the opposite direction. Barely a day goes by without a headline relating to the ongoing trade war with China or a new executive action being taken that curtails free trade or freedom of movement across borders. This trend has accelerated rapidly as a result of the pandemic and global economic recession. The walls are tightening in around us while we're distracted by all these other problems. Now, against this backdrop, it's open source. I don't think it's a coincidence that the first version of the GPL was released in 1989, or that the Linux kernel adopted GPL v2 in 1992, or that we've seen enormous growth in open source from the 1990s through 2000s. In fact, I would argue that the open source community wouldn't be as successful and large as it is now if it weren't for the environment in which it's been fostered and nurtured. Our community thrives and goes hand in hand with things like free trade and open borders. To borrow a famous saying, information wants to be free. So what happens when that nurturing environment, that supporting foundation is taken out from under us, from under the open source community? There's been a spate of headlines recently that show an acceleration in this trend. Like I said, not a week goes by without yet another restriction on trade. In fact, I bet that between the time I record this presentation and the time it gets streamed, we're going to see yet another major headline. Now, I admit that not all these headlines relate to export controls, but remember, export controls are only one aspect of this increasingly harsh environment. I also admit that these headlines are very US-centric, but let's face it, a lot of our environment really is driven by US government rulemaking. And hey, it's not just the United States. Other countries have similar export control regimes. Look, I'm not gonna go into them. As much as I'm not an expert in US export controls, I'm even less an expert on say the EU's export controls, but they exist. And it's enough for our purposes today to understand that they're similar. It's also worth noting that the flip side of export is import. There are laws and regulations that affect the ability to bring stuff into countries as well. Think of the TikTok ban. That's really an import ban, not an export ban, but it likewise affects our ability to interact across borders. You can see this play out with a response to the executive orders that ban TikTok and WeChat, which have nothing to do with export controls. China, just a few days ago, release new rules in response to that, that limit the ability to export technology related to data processing and speech and text recognition. That's an incredibly broad category and a large escalation of what's arguably a limited executive order. I'm highlighting this because the trend of escalating tit for tat bans concerns me. And speaking of TikTok, Look at the escalating border conflict between India and China in the Himalayas. One very present and real effect of that conflict has been a ban on sharing certain technology. This isn't a simple US problem. It really is a global problem for a global open source community. So I've been using the term export a lot. We should really define it. An export covers a situation that you're likely already familiar with, sending products out of a country. But an export also covers a couple situations you might not have expected. For example, sending technical data out of the United States counts as an export. And sending products or technical data within the United States is an export too if the recipient is a non-US citizen or isn't a permanent resident. NDAs working for the same company, they don't make a difference. 
For example, if you send an email to someone else at the same company you work at, who's in the United States on a visa, but not a permanent resident, you just exported something under the law. So you're subject to export controls. Those export controls come from three primary sources. First, there's ITAR. It's focused on things like munitions, things that are more clearly military in nature. Second, you have the EAR, which is focused on dual use technologies. Things like encryption or the things I was talking about, AI, ML, et cetera, they can be used both for civilian and military use. And third, there are US sanctions issued by OFAC. And also note that there are myriad other related laws and regulations. For example, the ATF has munitions import control regulations. There are anti-boycott regulations. There's the FCPA, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. There's CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. But we don't have time to talk about all that. Let's just look at the EAR. And remember, the underpinning statutory authority is the ECRA, which was passed only a couple years ago. So what exactly does the EAR cover? The authorizing statute just refers to, quote, emerging and foundational technologies. Well, BIS issued a recent rule that provides a list of sample technologies that it intends to regulate. As you can see, the list is rather expansive. It includes some categories here that at least cause me to raise an eyebrow. For example, artificial intelligence and machine learning. There's a lot of development effort these days in those areas. And a lot of AI and ML products are built on open source code and open source models. I find microprocessor technology an interesting inclusion here too. That's mainly because given the way freedom of expression works, I think the law could potentially treat hardware differently from software, even if they're both expressed as source code. Think about the potential creative difference between say a hardware description in Verilog versus an encryption algorithm in C. How might that affect the open hardware movement? I also find data analytics technology an interesting phrase because what is that? That seems really broad. When you drill down into the examples for each of these categories, and these are actually in the regulations, it feels even broader. Under AI, you can see categories like computer vision, speech and audio processing, natural language processing. There's a lot of amazing open source development in these areas. I'm not convinced that microprocessor technology is a narrow category either. I mean, look at the examples. These are broad. System on a chip, stacked memory, and data analytics. It includes visualization, automated analysis algorithms, context-aware computing. That seems to cover a heck of a lot of what both tech companies and non-tech companies do. So the good news is the first regulatory ban that has come out of BIS in about January of this year, based on the ECRA, is fairly narrow. The headlines have said things like, US announces AI software export restrictions. Recall that headline from an earlier slide. But in reality, the regulation is narrowly tailored to a particular type of geospatial imagery software that has lots of specific requirements that I think most open source projects in the space would be unlikely to meet. And I mean, I'm gonna fly through the slide. I know it's hard to read. I just want you to get the general impression of how detailed the requirements are. If you do actually read the re regulatory requirements, they seem to be more about specialized proprietary software. Maybe something that's developed under a government contract, not an open source project. So it, it is promising that the first export control rule coming out of the ECRA is so narrow. But we need to keep in mind government history and the context for these regulations. I'm reminded of two things that I've used and that I bet many of you have used as well, that have been subject to export controls. 
here, we have the Sony PlayStation 2. In 1999, BIS ruled that the PS2 was subject to export controls because there's an American-made chip inside that rose to the level of a super supercomputer. And it could conceivably be used by the Chinese government to simulate nuclear explosions. On the right here, we have pretty good privacy, PGP. The developer of PGP, Phil Zimmerman, was subject to a criminal investigation because at the time, <clears throat> encryption keys larger than 40 bits were subject to export controls. Now, there's an interesting loophole in the regulations. Publications aren't subject to export controls. As a result, Phil published the entire source code of PGP in a book, which could then be exported, scanned in via OCR, and compiled into a working copy of PGP without running afoul of the law. That loophole expanded as a result of a couple lawsuits, Bernstein v. U.S. Department of Justice and Younger v. Daly. <clears throat> These cases are remembered for establishing the legal rule that the publication of source code is protected as free speech under the First Amendment but I encourage you to pull the cases and to read them. The case aids are right there on the slide. So you can type them into Google Scholar. Every mention of these cases that I've seen refers to this expansive free speech holding that source code is free speech. But if you actually read the cases, and you don't need to be a lawyer to do this, you'll see that the cases are actually much narrower than that. In Bernstein, the court said, and I quote, we emphasize the narrowness of our First Amendment holding. We do not hold that all software is expressive. We hold merely that, and now I'm paraphrasing, the, particularly, the particular regulatory regime at that time constitutes an impermissible prior restraint on speech. The court also said the government can't block ideas, but it can block products. And so what, unsurprisingly, there's a footnote that the court added that states national security could justify a prior restraint on free speech. Seriously, go read the opinions. I don't think they actually protect what we think they're protecting. And as I read the ECRA and the case law, I don't see those expansive protections we're relying upon. As far as I can tell, the exception that allows publication of source code, whether it's in a book or on the internet, actually comes from the EAR, which is a regulation, not case law or statute. And given what we've been seeing with other rulemaking and executive actions in recent years, I don't think it's far-fetched to imagine a world in which a little more rulemaking causes these protections to disappear, right? Because you can change the regulations without having to pass a law. It would still be limited constitutionally, but the court has already said there are limits on the Constitution's right to free speech. So in the end, what does that mean for you? What if you have an open source project that's already been posted publicly on GitHub? Well, I think the practical effect is likely none. It's business as usual. If you think about this pragmatically, the open source code is already out there. The idea is already out there in the wild. You can't unring that bell, so to speak. So it would be absurd to subject that to new export controls. That said, make sure you're meeting the regulatory requirements. For example, if you have encryption in your project, then there's a requirement that you send notices to a couple different government email addresses. It's pretty simple. But what about the future? Right. I'm, I'm concerned about the chilling effect, the cause for the causes of harm that we might not be able to prevent. Look, many of my past predictions haven't come to fruition. I'm wrong a lot, but I think if you extrapolate from the current trends, you're going to see these trend lines continue, maybe even accelerate further. This is true regardless of whatever administration is, office, is in office next year because it goes way beyond that. Generally, I think there's going to be less willingness or ability to collaborate across borders 
that in turn harms the open source community. Remember that it's not just the US. Other countries have a greater ability to prevent exports. And not all of this will be driven by export controls or official government rulemaking. So what can we do as a community? I brainstormed a few ideas, I threw them on the slide. Some of them are practical, some of them are less so. I'm open to hearing other ideas of things we can try to do to mitigate against these risks. I'll just conclude by saying that I don't necessarily have any solutions for you. In fact, you might leave this talk truly dissatisfied, but my goal here isn't to give you a solution. Rather, I just want to increase awareness and to bring this topic to the forefront of the conversation. Although there's been a little bit of recent attention, for example, the Linux Foundation released a great white paper a couple months ago, it's been about 20 years since there's been much discussion devoted to these topics in the tech community. And then I just firmly believe that if there are more eyes on the problem, then it will be less likely for this to blow up into yet another crisis that we have to deal with. And ideally, if we're successful, then years later, we can look back at this presentation and say, hey, what was the point of that again? Yeah, and since I'm in a public chat, I see Mario just posted something. Um, is it only related to software? Do you also consider hardware as you give examples? Um, yeah, I, you know, honestly, I'm thinking about software a lot, but export controls, they apply to both software and hardware. And one of the notes that you said earlier is that I, I actually kind of worry that export controls will apply more strictly to hardware and not be as well protected under the law. There, there's something I was thinking about that borrows from copyright doctrine, which is the merger doctrine, where if, if there's more than one way to express something, then you can get a copyright. But if there's only one way to really express it, then you can't get a copyright. Um, I, I don't think courts have necessarily equated that yet with how expressive something is under the First Amendment, but I could see less First Amendment protection for like a very long hardware description as opposed to something written in a high level language for software. And I'm just trying to get over the fact that I watched myself give a presentation. Um, oh, so the sure notes, there's a question. Much of this talk focused on export laws from software originating from the US. Uh, what impact do you see at US export laws having on open source software developed outside of the US, e.g. a popular open source project developed in Kenya? So you know, to answer the specific, the literal language of the question, there should actually be no true impact from US export laws. Um, but I can, let, let me reframe that a little bit because one, the US lobbies other countries heavily in order to change their export control laws or to change their policies, their, their foreign policy, right? So Huawei is a big example of that in the so-called race to 5G. The United States has convinced some countries around the world in order to spurn China, right? Um, do the potential national security concerns. But, but something else that I'm thinking about here, so there are two other things. One, remember that all exports are an import. So there are actually separate import restrictions. Um, you know, it could be something related to the patent law, it could be something else. Um, we actually have an entire commission that I used to practice before uh, that's just built for blocking imports, right? The U.S. International Trade Commission. The other thing is, you know, what, what makes me think about this more are the tit for tat bans, right? So look at look at foreign laws as well, and that's certainly something where I'm just not an expert in. But like when after the United States released the executive order that bans TikTok, China about a month later released something that bans something even more broad for export, right? And and as the US keeps on escalating, I could see other countries escalating in response as well. Um, and that would limit our ability to use foreign developed open source software, right? And, and this is not just true for places like traditional adversaries like Russia. Um, look at the tariff fight that's occurring with Europe. I know this is a totally different topic or space, but you know, I saw an article the other day about how LVMH doesn't want to buy Tiffany anymore due to es the escalating trade war um, between the United States and Europe. So these things have a lot of far reaching implications that people don't necessarily expect immediately. Yeah, it, yeah, so McCoy, like, so 
something that you might actually know about related to Russia is I've heard that some countries have, um, or rather some companies have diversified their risk by creating separate teams in other countries where our laws may prevent export. So when it, in my last slide, when I was talking about encouraging geographic diversification to manage risk, that's actually what I was thinking about because say countries start building um, borders or walls that prevent us from collaborating with one another. If there's development going on within a country that can continue, right? So one of the ways to get around these issues is to plan ahead and make sure that we're not just like getting contributions for projects from one region of the world, but, but like maybe even duplicate effort from other regions in the world too. Yeah, so it, I, I do admit a lot of this relates to China and US, um, at least that's the proxy by which a lot of this is being fought. Yeah, what options are there for lawmakers? And then maybe stopping sending microchips. China can weaken or slow down the expansion of repression, but how should we deal with this in regards to free and open source software? Um, we want to collaborate, but it also gets more difficult as they block VPNs in China. It is all just so difficult. Yeah, um, plus one to the fact that it is all just so difficult. I don't even think that's an opinion. I'm calling it a fact. Um, you know, it's funny because like when it comes to lawmakers, I mean, I, I don't think it's controversial to say that I don't think lawmakers understand their space and they don't understand this either. So a lot of it is really, we need to talk to them, right? And we need to submit comments for government rulemaking. People actually do read this stuff, even if they end up ignoring our comments in order to pass whatever regulation they actually want to pass. Um, you know, it, it, maybe I'm misunderstanding the question, but it, it's it's tough, right? And I, I've seen some talk about how other countries and have pointed out to the U.S. government that a lot of these rules just don't make sense, right? Like, why are we dividing um, products from, like, say, publications? Why are we parsing out um, dual-use items from military-only items, right? Because, for example, I understand the Chinese government actually said once the United States, well, you know, everything we do is in support of both the economy and our national defense. Therefore, if you send anything to China whatsoever, you're going to support our national defense. Therefore, it just doesn't make any sense to have these sorts of rules. You know, how do you legislate around this? And I think the US government is struggling to figure out the right way to do it. But as they're struggling, um, the side effects, the unintended con consequences uh, can be very interesting, especially when it comes to something like open source that's certainly not top of mind for our legislation, legislators, legislatures. Thanks everyone, take care.